on the track is the Red Tiny Shoes track. This one was released on October 6th. Tiny Shoes from whatever else that doesn't feel like making up, up the second for your figures. Enjoy. So what's in today's show, Mr. John? Well, Hennis, this is the last episode of 2023, and I have a new hat. We'll be talking about the hat later, and we'll also be talking about some new evidence which has recently surfaced in the story of the Hook Island Sea Serpent. And we'll be welcoming back our old friend Ian Squibbs to tell us all about it. I really like the old credits. Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name's John. What? Who? What's happening over there? It looks like there are two orange appendix talking about things. As I think mean, you sound as you would no doubt have called them. So, hello my dear. Are you going to have uh, any New Year's Eve celebrations at said Wet Pants School? Eh, we are. Yes, we are. The altars of Shabnigurath, Black Goat of the Woods, will be redly wettened with the blood of white goats. I are Shabnigurath, Black Goat of the Woods with a thousand young. She manifests as a great sickening black cloud from which ropey tentacles ending in cloven hooves protrude and great fanged mouths like obscene sphincters open up in her unwholesome mass. She is a goddess of dark fertility. That's splendid. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was Gwen and Helga Dibley broadcasting from some strange, eldritch, non-Euclidean nightmare somewhere deep in the home counties. But before we were interrupted by the non-Euclidean Lovecraftian nightmare, I want to tell you, I'm trying to tell you, that my name's John Downs, I'm the director of the Centre for Fortean Zoology, and welcome to another episode of On The Track. And before we go any further, it's actually Christmas afternoon when I'm filming this, and as you can see, I am wearing a magnificent hat. And this was gifted to me very generously by my old friend and sometimes collaborator, Mr. V. McQuinnan, who you hear me talk about at the end of nearly every show, and who is the one who does the Welsh accent at the beginning of one track extra. And he's somebody I've known and been very fond of for something like 35 years. And he gave me this magnificent hat, I think because he's trying to rebrand me as a sort of cryptozoological viv stanchel, which isn't too far from the truth, I suppose, and I've always liked these hats. So thank you very much for my hat, V, and I'm sure whether or not you know who viv stanchel is, you will agree that this is a most remarkably impressive titfa. Now, for those of you who don't know what On The Track is, Every Wednesday evening at 6.30 for about a quarter of an hour and every Saturday afternoon at 3 for about twice that we bring you a miscellany, a mishmash, a melange and all sorts of other things beginning with M about hard science, weird shit and surreality. What surreality, I hear you ask? Well, apart from the fact that you have a fat man with long hair and a beard, dressed as substantial, and co-presenting with him is an anthropomorphic chicken, which our friends in Denmark think is some sort of Gnostic archon. 
what is the reality? I think we need to go and ask Queen Victoria. The reality is what happens when some foreign fellows impose ridiculous aspects upon reality to try and show that the world is fundamentally insane. And we are not amused. Well, Your Majesty, I think we've already established on a number of occasions in this show that Johnny Foreigner is a rum cove. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, last night, and this is being recorded, by the way, three days before you're going to be watching this, because once again I've been overtaken by events and I'm having to rush and put shows together a week later than I should have done. But Christmas does disrupt everything. Last night I was sent this news story by my dear friend and the show's producer, Louis Rosier. Check this out. And bear in mind that in a book I wrote with Nigel Wright over 20 years ago, I pointed out that there are nearly always a whole string of fortune zoological occurrences when Britain is either at war or in imminent danger of being at war and if this news story is correct we shall be at war with Russia within the next 10 years unless something happens in the meantime and I very much hope that this something would be that Ukraine manages to completely turn the tables on Russia and that the threat of the Russian bear is negated at least for this generation and at least during my lifetime. Because remember that Britain and Russia have been struggling with each other both overtly and covertly for hundreds of years. We don't want to fight go Russian bear but by jingo if we do we've got the guns, we've got the ships, we've got the numbers too cause we fought the bear before and while we're all Britain spraying through the Russians show not that song was written in the 1870s during the Crimean War, which is most famous these days for Florence Nightingale, Mary Seacole and the Charge of the Light Brigade. But it is a example of how Britain and Russia have been facing up against each other for hundreds of years and it looks like we're facing off against each other now. So what has this got to do with Fortiana? Well in a book that I wrote with Nigel Wright over 20 years ago I pointed out that for some reason presently unknown although I have a few inklings of ideas Whenever Britain is at war, or under threat of war, the numbers of sightings of anomalous, peculiar and altogether quite scary animals, or things that appear to be animals, increases. And this is happening now. And this was happening before Louis sent me that news story last night. For example, literally last night, a group of people who were doing an organised ghost hunting expedition in Waverley Abbey near Farnham in Surrey saw what they believed was a dragon. Check this out. 
A dragon was seen at a place called West Clandon, which is only about 14 miles away from the Abbey, back in 1796, which is, as I'm sure anybody, even those who, like me, still count on their fingers, can say was something like just over 200 years ago. And it's not something that's very well known. Back in the 90s, I believe, let me just check the date here, back in the, hang on, it wasn't the 1990s, in April 2007, the Fortean Forums discussed a story whereby a time slip apparently took place in the grounds of the Abbey. And so it's a place with a long history of high strangeness. At the moment I'm interviewing all the different witnesses and I'm not going to go into any detail because this show's coming out in three days time and I don't want to um, influence or otherwise any of the eyewitnesses. But we will be bringing you the results of our investigation as soon as we are able. But in the meantime, there's more. This last week, my dear sweet housekeeper, Judy, told me that the grandson of one of her other clans recently saw a strange animal so horrific that he finds it difficult to talk about it, let alone describe it, but it was carrying the body of either a fox or a dog. And I have written to him, I'm waiting to hear his account of what happened to him, if I can possibly get him to tell me. And, of course, as you know, the sightings and subsequent investigation carried out by Daniel Barnett and his crew into a series of pieces of evidence of a British Bigfoot in the forest in Somerset close to his home has kick-started reports from quite a few different parts of the country of British Bigfoot. I still don't like using the word British Bigfoot. I prefer using the word BHN which stands, if you don't know, for Big Hairy Monster. But unfortunately British Bigfoot has taken over the public imagination and I am certainly not a stronger enough personality to be able to fight the public imagination. So we're going to have to just run with it for the time being. But these are just some of the strange accounts which are coming from all over the country at the moment. And there is a war brewing. So what do you think is causing it? Have you had any weird reports or any weird sightings of your own? Please contact me in the comments below and I promise you that we will be looking into it on your behalf. And we know a song about that, don't we, boys and girls? We don't want to fight the Russian bear But by jingo it might happen and has this anything to do with modern sighting of a dragon? And the great hairy beasts that are spotted wandering through the forests of our land? Well, me and the little Tinkerbell will do our best to understand. By any metric, being involved in a multi-theatre war would be a disaster for us all, but it might just possibly provide an interesting living laboratory for those of us interested in the causes and the effects of the anomalous mystery animals which are reported in this country and around the world and which by logic cannot be described in purely zoological frameworks. So it's all not quite bad news. Not all quite bad news, but let's hope that it doesn't happen. 
However, if this global build-up to war does provide more information about the nature of things like dragons and BHM phenomena, we will do our best to bring you as much of this evidence as we possibly can and to share it with you for free here on CFZ TV. If any of you have got sightings or theories or accounts of your own, please contact me through the um, comments below and I will do my best to investigate each one as thoroughly as we possibly can. And now to change the subject completely. Some months ago, our old friend of the show, Ian Squibbs, who is a regular visitor here and who is particularly fascinating on the subject of lake and sea monsters, told us the peculiar and many faceted story of the Hook Island sea monster, a mysterious object that was claimed to be a sea serpent photographed by a guy called Robert Le Sarek back in the 1960s. Totally coincidentally, this was my first encounter with cryptozoology because I heard the story of Robert Glusarek and the Hook Island Sea Monster on the Rediffusion radio in Hong Kong when I was a boy and it totally captivated me although it wasn't for many years that I just until I discovered that no less a person than Hoyvons himself had cast some doubt on the original story. Ian Squibbs told us all about it some months ago and now we're going back to the subject with him because he has uncovered some interesting new evidence. Ever since I saw the photo many years ago, I've always had a bit of a thing for the Hook Island Sea Monster and the striking images that come with the story. So um, in December last year, John and myself covered the story on CFZ TV, didn't we, John? So yes, we did that. Did. And did. Um, so we yeah, we did. Yeah. So we're not gonna go through all that again, but let's have a quick recap. So a French photographer by the name of Robert Le Sarec took some photos of a sea monster in shallow waters at Whitsunday Islands off uh, the Queensland coast in Australia. One photo of which has become a bit of a 40 in classic over the years. Um, studies show that the creature in the photo is probably a fake created using some form of fabric or plastic weighed down by sand. Additionally, a character study of Lyserec showed him to be a shady individual who would do something like fake a sea serpent photo for cash. So, that aside, it is a striking image, uh, as we can see. So, let's have a quick look at the uh, the picture and jog our memories. There we go. There, that's, uh, that's it. It's uh, So, here we go. We have the long, giant tadpole type creature dominating the image there but for me it's not just that it's a nice photo obviously a sunny day and the crystal clear waters of queensland and looking at it makes me want to go for a swim in the sea uh, as long as the monster isn't there of course and um, i'm not gonna get into the water with that <laughs> The quality of the photo isn't as good as we've got today, but it was taken in the 1960s, and uh, that's what photos of the day were like. It's an image of a different time. JFK, Vietnam, the moon landings, and hippies, and the guy in the boat in the background. I wonder what he's up to these days, but I'm getting a bit carried away. But you get the idea. You get the idea there. Anyway... Earlier this year, I did another talk about the Hook Island Sea Monster for another 14 channel. And um, when I was reviewing the photos, I came across um, a photo of the creature that had a bit better focus than you usually get. So you get so the details were clearer. So if we just look at the next image there, uh, John, that's the picture number 
three, we've got there. So what we can see is the black and white photo. Um, so it's more of a closer view of the creature. And the uh, the focus, the focus is better than you normally get with these uh, with these um, Hook Island uh, pictures. So what we got then? Let's have a look and see. We can see the head and uh, what should be the eyes, and then we've got the the tail, uh, the body tailing off into the background. But if you look closely on the edge of the head, on the right hand side, as we see it, we can see a sort of a broken black area if you look closely and in that area we can see a series of markings consisting of four small lines kind of bunched together and the same sort of marking is repeated in three different places and the, what i've done i've actually zoomed in on this section of the photo so we can have a closer look so let's just look at the next picture there uh, john and just just zoomed in image number four if we look at that we can see the markings closer there right so now as i mentioned earlier the most popular theory for the monster is that it is a fake constructed with fabric weighed down on the seafloor with sand and i think that theory is correct and the small markings that we're looking here looking at here are in fact finger marks that were made when the hoaxers pushed sand onto the edge of the fabric by hand to hold it into place i may be wrong but i can think of no other explanation for these markings um if they are handprints and i think that's what they are then that was a bit careless of the photographer to release that photo so so there we are just an observation that i've had uh since our last review of the hook island incident so the moral of the story is if you want to fake a monster photo do it properly and don't give the game away by making silly schoolboy errors thank you thank you If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And there's the ghost of Joe Strummer, who's an ever more regular visitor to my little house, will tell you. Don't forget to ring the notification bell, otherwise you won't be told when the next episode's gonna be. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it? If you've been affected by any of the topics in today's episode, you can just bugger off, because we don't give a monkeys. Bloody well, get a grip! Sort your own bloody problems out, rather than ringing up somewhere. And that, my dear friends, is the end of another episode and the end of another year. I will be back, as you have, may have guessed, next year. But before that, I just want to say thank you to all the people who have been part of this show. Particularly my guests this week have been Richard Freeman, V. McQuinnan and Ian Squibbs. Thank you all for supporting us over the last year. A big thank you to Graham Inglis, who looks after me, because he's not only Deputy Director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, but he's also my carer, and he has to put up with all my health issues, which is a bit of a pain in the neck for him. Thank you, mate. I do appreciate it. And I want to say thank you to my producer, Louis, and to Guinevere, the Assistant Director of the Centre for Fortune Zoology, who worked so hard for us, I really, truly couldn't do any of this without her. So, I will be back on Wednesday. And what am I going to be doing on Wednesday? I believe that I'm going to be going through the 2024 and 2025 CFZ yearbook 
And I'll be back on Saturday. What am I going to be doing on Saturday? For God's sake, I don't know. I've only just finished doing this Saturday's show. But there will be a show next Saturday and I'll be doing something extraordinarily jolly, whatever it turns out to be being. So, are you listening, Mr. McCrinnan? If you're going to be watching us, and I'm going to be not only in the show, but I'm going to be doing the live chat and everything else that I always do on Saturday afternoons. Mr. McQuillan, if you're going to be watching us, and me in particular, I'll be seeing you.